Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, our text this morning will be verses 31 and 32. As we come back to this, the greatest chapter in the Bible, after our brief and timely interlude in Psalm 91, which very much fits into... uh, All that Paul says in many ways is the Old Testament version of these verses we find here in Romans 8. We come back to a word that we most desperately need to hear. If God is for us, who can be against us? But in order to hear that word of God with ears of faith, ears that can hear the good news of that gospel, we need God's help. So I'd ask you please to pray with me. Almighty God, we do come as your people, your people united by your spirit, those scattered throughout this city and indeed throughout our country joining the, this live stream. And we beg of you to pour out your spirit upon us. O oh, spirit of the living God, we pray, fall fresh on us and open our eyes of faith that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel Give us ears of faith to hear the good news, the glad tidings that our God reigns. And give us hearts to believe, indeed to arise and go to Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us... Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when I was in college, I was on a debate team, and it was the first time that I had done cross-examination debate, and I loved it. I, I much preferred the constructive side or the affirmative side of the debate questions that we got, and I especially loved the constructive side of the debate, of, of doing all the research and, and putting together the argument and, and laying out the variety of points and answering the questions from, from the cross ex but I especially enjoyed the final rebuttal. After all was said and done, it was a chance to summarize the whole and to show that my opponents, our opponents, had not defeated a single argument. And the way you did that, of course, is you flow the debate. You have this this sheet of paper where you have your arguments, their rebuttals, and then you show with your own data rebutting their rebuttal, and then you summarize it in the end. And so I would take that sheet, that flow chart up, and I would say, well, we argued this, and they said that, but we rebutted with this, the point goes to us. And point by point, I would show that we had carried the debate. And in that last minute, there'd be a final summing up to persuade the judges to vote for our team so that we might win. You know, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here, here at the end of Romans 8. The the Apostle Paul has laid out this massive argument that started in verse 1. No, no, really, it goes all the way back to Romans chapter 1. But here in Romans 8, he's, he's made his way through the range of benefits that are ours through our union with Jesus Christ. Justification and sanctification, adoption, glorification. These glorious things that are ours through, through the work of Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, and he's talked about the various virtues of faith, hope, and love that are ours. And And as he comes to sum it all up, you see it there in your Bibles, there at the beginning of verse 31, he asks, what then shall we say to these things? You can almost imagine a bit of a smile crossing the Apostle Paul's face as he begins this final diatribe with seven questions in eight verses, four of which are structurally significant. And his smile comes because he knows 
He's clinched his argument. He, he knows that he's won the debate. But even more, he knows that the God who's come for us in Jesus Christ has done everything necessary for our salvation. God has shown us in, his, in the cross, in the empty tomb, that God is for us. Well, the text says, if God is for us. But, but that construction is a conditional a conditional that really communicates since God is for us. In other words, this is, this is a certainty. We, we might struggle with fears and doubts, but from Paul's perspective, God has shown us enough and he's told us enough to calm our hearts and to persuade us that in fact God is for us. From the earliest chapters in Romans all the way back to Romans chapter 1, he had said it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Or Romans chapter 3, there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. Or Romans chapter 5. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And even in this chapter, in Romans chapter 8, we've heard how there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've heard how the Spirit sets us free from the power of death and has brought us into new life, how the Spirit himself dwells in us, not only to help us to say no to sin, but actually to raise our bodies from the grave in the last day. And all of these things, from Romans 1 all the way to this present moment, to verse 31, should persuade our hearts, this is true, it's a certainty. God is for us. He's certainly for us, and he's completely for us. It doesn't matter what our circumstances tell us. After all, times are pretty tough right now. Tougher to some of us than others, and yet, some in our congregation have, have lost their jobs in this downturn. Others have had parents and loved ones get sick and die, and they're unable to be with them. Still others of us are fearful of, of what may come, the, of the surge that's coming, and this future that's in front of us, and we're deeply anxious. Yet others of us are grieving, going through all the stages, it seems all at once, of denial and anger, of bargaining, of depression, acceptance perhaps, trying to find meaning, but all jumbled up inside. Still others of us have had to change our plans. It's precious plans, special plans, once-in-a-lifetime plans, graduation plans, wedding plans, travel plans. Circumstances cause us to wonder, is God for us? But, but what we hear, the Apostle Paul telling us is, yes, God is for us. He's for you. And he's for you completely. It doesn't matter what other people may say. Over the last couple of weeks of being cooped up at home, and especially over this week with this, the stay-at-home order in effect, we've had arguments with our spouses and our children in ways that have, haven't happened in years. We've said things and they've said things that are awful. People have said things about us that were slanderous and false or mean-spirited and wrong-headed, and maybe we've said the same about others. But it doesn't matter what other people say if what Paul says is true, since what Paul says is true, since God is for us, he's for us completely, no matter what other people say. And it doesn't matter how the devil attacks us. And to be sure, the devil has been working overtime using this panic the panic of my heart, the panic of your heart, to shake us, 
to enter into our heads with all kinds of voices that are not our voice, and not the Spirit's voice, accusing and attacking, dredging up things that we committed decades ago, sins that we committed decades ago, or sins that we committed last night, to accuse us, to beat us with them. But it doesn't matter what our circumstances or other people or the devil himself say. Because what God says here in his word is true. Since God is for us, he is for us completely. Friends, here's a place we can stand. We can stand right here in the face of our circumstances, in the face of what other people say, in the face of what the devil himself might attack us with. Since God is for us certainly and completely we need fear nothing. No one or nothing can take this truth and make it untrue. Indeed, we need to heed the counsel of Martin Luther in a letter that he wrote to one of, the, of his counselees under his charge. He said, learn Christ in him crucified. Learn to pray to him and despairing of yourself, say, you, Lord Jesus, are my righteousness, but I am your sin. You have taken upon yourself what is mine and given to me what is yours. You have taken upon yourself what you were not and you have given to me what I am not. And why can't we pray that way? Why in our times of doubt and fear and anxiety in the face of our circumstances and what other people say and how the devil attacks us, why can we say these things? Why can we pray this way? Because God is for us. Certainly, completely, and he has shown us that he is for us because God gave for us. And specifically, he gave his one and only son for us. That is the good news itself. That is the gospel. We heard it in the assurance of pardon that God so loved the world. And in loving the world, he loved you. That he gave his one and only son and in this giving, he did not spare. That's what Paul says. Verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He did not spare. He did not withhold his one and only son. And in using that word spare or withhold, Paul's reaching back through time and through the pages of Scripture all the way back to Genesis chapter 22. Do you remember that scene? There in Genesis 22, God had told Abraham, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And so you remember, Abraham took Isaac, the son of his love, the child of promise. He takes Isaac on a three-day journey to Moriah. And when, Mar when Isaac begins looking around at what, what Abraham has packed, he sees the wood, he sees the fire, he sees the knife. But where's the lamb, daddy? And Abraham replies, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. But by the time they get to the mountain... And by the time Isaac is bound, and by the time Isaac is laid on the altar, the lamb hadn't come. And so Abraham took the knife with Isaac laid on the altar. And he's about ready to take the knife and to plunge it down into his son before God stops him with these words. And he says, do not lay your hand on that boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up, and he saw there God had provided a ram for the sacrifice. And Paul's referring to that scene Abraham did not spare. Abraham did not withhold his son, his only son, the son of his love, the child of promise, but God spared him. God spared Abraham's son. God spared Isaac. And he provided a substitute. 
He provided for himself a lamb for the offering. But see what, see what Paul says here? When it comes to us, when it comes to you and me, when it comes to our salvation, God went further than Abraham. God did not withhold his only son. He did not withhold the son he loved from all eternity. He did not withhold his only son, Jesus, the child of promise, the perfect prophet, priest, and king. He did not withhold him. He did not spare him, but he willingly gave him up. He did not spare his only son. He did not spare him from identifying with his sinful people. He did not spare him from the temptation of the wilderness. He did not spare him from, from the hatred of the Pharisees. He did not spare him from disease or demonic attack. He did not spare him from Gethsemane. He did not spare him from the betrayal of Judas. He did not spare him from the mockery of justice by both Jews and Romans. He did not spare him from the scourging that left him bloody and raw. He did not spare him from the nails pierced into his hands and into his feet. He did not spare him the darkness turning noon into night. He did not spare him from the cup of God's wrath. He did not spare him from God's forsakenness. He did not spare him from his own dying. And he did not spare him from the spear piercing his side. He did not spare him from being laid, buried in a tomb. And he did not spare him from remaining under the power of death from three days. God spared Jesus none of this. And why? Because he loves you. It's because he loves you. And he's for you. He's for us, this God. And so if you have any doubt this morning, in the face of your circumstances, as other people slander you and say rotten things about you, when the devil himself attacks you, whatever else may befall you, if you have any doubt this morning that God is for you, look to the cross of Jesus, because there at the cross you would see that God did not spare his son, but he handed him over. I mean, that's what gave him up literally means there in verse 32. God handed Jesus over to die. And it's striking that the Gospels use the Greek word that the ESV translates gave him up for us all there. The Gospels use that Greek word over and again in connection with the Passion Week. Those Gospel accounts tell us that the betrayer Judas handed Jesus over. They tell us that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders handed Jesus over. The people of Jerusalem, they handed Jesus over. Pontius Pilate, after he washed his hands, he handed Jesus over. And while all of these human actors did their part and they made their free choices out of evil hearts of malice to hand Jesus over, whom does the Apostle Paul say actually handed Jesus over? He said, God did. He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all. God did not spare Jesus, but handed him over to be crucified. And my friends, this is how God would provide for himself the lamb. He himself would be the lamb for the sacrifice. The lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And why does he do this? Because he, he does it for you. It's because he loves you. This, this God who's above all and rules over all. Who is our covenant God of our fathers. The promise maker. The promise keeper. He's the one who loves you. He's the one who's for you. And he shows you this fact. And that he gave for you. And because God gave his one and only son for you, we have certainty this morning, my friends, that God will give for us. 
That's what Paul says. Since God gave Jesus, did not spare him, handed him over his only son, the son of his eternal love, the child of promise. Since he did this, we can be sure that God will give us all things. Now, all things there at the end of verse 32, they aren't everything, as in everything we want. <laughs> no, when, when Paul says here, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This means all things as in everything that we have coming to us. Everything that is our inheritance. And so this reaches back to Romans 8 verse 17. And reminds us that we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ Jesus. It reminds us that we have an inheritance that will certainly come our way. And what is that inheritance, my friends? It's glory. It's heaven. It's resurrection. It's the new heavens and the new earth. God's unstoppable purpose that we will be glorified as he sees us now will certainly be accomplished. We will know the glory that's been prepared for us. It will happen. It is sure God will give us all things. And again, if we have any doubts, then we, we return to what God has told us here. Since God has given us his most prized possession, his most precious person, the eternal son of his love to secure salvation for us, friends, he'll certainly bring us to glory. He'll certainly give us all things. But don't miss this. In giving us all things, he wants us to see and to know that the all things pales in comparison to the best thing. Did you catch it? There at the end of verse 32? How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Yes, justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification. Yes, faith, hope, love. Yes, glory, heaven, resurrection, new heavens, new earth. But friends, listen to me. Glory isn't glory. And salvation isn't salvation. And faith, hope, and love are worthless. They don't matter if we don't have Jesus. If we don't have Jesus, none of it matters. But here's the gospel. Here's the good news. We get Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. He is the good news. That you would have a relationship with the Lord of glory himself. That he would commit himself to us and that we might be owned by him so that we can say he is ours and we are his. And friends, he's enough. I wonder this morning... I wonder if you know this. In the face of all that confronts us, do you know Jesus? Have you put your trust in him? Not, not just some point in the past. Are you trusting him now? Not when you were 11 or 20 or 30. But now, today, at this moment, are you trusting in him? Are you resting in him? Do you have confidence this morning? That God is for you. Is that confidence rooted in what he's already done for you in Jesus Christ? Is your heart's deepest desire to know him? Can you say with Paul in Philippians 3 that everything else is, is worthless? It's not worth putting in the scales. It's the refuse of the earth compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. Can you say that this morning? When you're alone, when people oppose you, when the devil attacks you, can you say, give me Jesus? Give me Jesus. You can have the whole world, but give me Jesus. He's the best thing in the world. And friends, if you would arise and go to Jesus, you will find that if you have Jesus... God's for you. You'll know it in your bones that God is for you, whatever confronts you. And listen, listen. 
if God is for you, who can be against you? Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, you can have the whole world. Just give us Jesus. Give me Jesus. Lord, I need him every hour. I need him every minute. I need him every second. I cannot sustain my own life unless Jesus has me in his hands. But bless you, Father, for your word that shows us how great a cost you paid. And the power of the cross is that we not only stand forgiven, but blood-bought and brought into relationship with you as sons and daughters of a king who's also our father. Lord, this is amazing grace. It's amazing, amazing grace. And so, Lord, grant us your mercies, grant us your joy as we sing your praise now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.